All right, the lesson of money, part three. And we're using the Liberty Bible Course booklets. And this, every time, I'd like to say, this study is written to be used in the King James Version of the Bible. Otherwise, your answers will be incorrect. We talked about tithes, offerings, and alms. Old Testament law before. We talked about the Old Testament law. We talked about the church age. We uh, talked about a will and heart. And God doesn't want you to give grudgingly. We talked about last week that big, bad, nasty word, taxes. We talked about does the government have a right since they're so wicked. We talked about do Christians have to pay taxes to a wicked government. And we talked about Jesus and the Roman government. I was wicked and he told us to pay to Caesar. That was Caesar's. So now, we part in number three lesson. What do you think today is about? Today is about loans. You know, loans are very low right now. Very tempting to go out and get one. Very tempting to go get something that we can't afford. But let's go on with the lesson and be careful about getting loans. Proverbs 22 7. About going to a bank, going to an organization and say, I need money. Proverbs 22 7. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. You know, when you go to that, that guy at the bank and you got all the stories, he's heard them all. There's only one thing in common, no one's got the money. And no one will back the idea. That's why he's there. It is so easy to go into debt today. I'm even thinking about the time I read a couple years ago that they were sending credit cards to college students with no strings attached except for the fact is when you get the monthly bill. They didn't say anything about that. And all these students will go out and buy, you know, the TV sets, the radios, the record players, and, you know, the boom boxes and buy everything to outfit their room. And then all of a sudden, at the end of the month, they get a piece of paper in the mail that says, you owe, and then interest. Well, wait a minute. I didn't know I had to pay that back. No, listen, that was two years ago. I don't know. They thought it was a free-for-all, whatever it was. Listen, when you, when you get a, 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 college, a college loan, you owe money back. Just pick up the newspaper and look at the ads. Buy now and make no payments until next year. It sounds so good, too. And it works, because they wouldn't be using that form of advertising if it didn't work. What's the old thing? If it works, don't fix it. And it's got to be working, because it's all over the place, especially car dealerships. No money down for 33 months and zero percent financing for you know until you can hold your breath it sounds so good until you have to start making the payments then you feel like the slave and that's exactly what you are when you work all week and discover that your whole check is already gone when you get it to make all the payments on the loans that you have occurred this is when the truth of the Bible hits home. The borrower is servant to the lender. You don't work for yourself no more. You work for that bank. You work for that loan company. They hold you. Now I'm talking about loans here. I'm not talking about medical bills. I'm not talking about a medical bill where you know you end up in the hospital and listen, you you got a million dollar bill. And that, that, that's not something you went out and asked for. Unless you wanted to prop up your body through plastic and, you know, made of Taiwan and other junk. 
All right, that's something else. I'm talking about you went out and you sought money that you don't have to buy something that you couldn't afford. Was that plain and simple enough? Before taking out a loan, consider carefully if you really need the item or you just want it. Need and want is very two words that are far apart. By taking out a loan, you are placing yourself under bondage to the lender, and you become his servant. Turn your Bibles and turn here to Philippians 4.19. Be willing to pray about things before you rush right out and buy them on time. On time means you're going to make payments monthly, yearly, whatever, weekly. Many miracles are missed because people are not willing to wait upon God to provide the things that they need. I had that with, with my car just recently. My car died and I went about looking for things. And uh, there's a program where you can buy, you pay every week this guy for a car, miss a payment, and then you know he's going to repossess it. And you have to pay more money to get it back and still continue the weekly payments. But God blessed me with money to buy a vehicle that even the mechanics are like, wow. So God got a blessing out of that. Now, let's look at Philippians 4.19. But my God shall supply all your wants according to his riches in the glory by Christ Jesus. Now that's what you want the Bible to say. Now listen. If my son came to me and said, hey, I'm getting married, Dad. I'm going to buy this slick little fast little car, four on the floor, two-seater. It's got, you know, eight cylinders. And boy, it can do from zero to 200 in three seconds. I'm going to say, son, first of all, speed limit 65. Second of all, if you're going to get married, you may need a third or fourth seat. And fifth of all, that piece of junk that you're going to buy is going to end up in a junkyard someday. Now, if you need a car, you need to look at gas mileage, how many seats it has, reliability. I mean, there are certain car makers out there that I would not buy from. You got to do subject and research. But the Bible says, I must have made a boo-boo, because it says, but my God should supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. You know what you need? You need water, food, and air. That's it. It's all you need. There's one great need that you need. You need Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's the most important need above all. You can live without clothes. Listen, if you walk stark naked down the street because you ain't got no clothes, somebody will get their needs to get you something. Guarantee. Guarantee. They'll arrest you and they'll put you in the prison uniform. They'll get you clothes. You don't need a car. There's buses and there's walking and there's bicycles. A car is a blessing. It's a responsibility that has much to go with it. Oh, I need a house. There are people living on these bridges. There are people living in cars today. Saved, born again, and serving God. And they're just probably just as happy as you are because they don't owe no mortgage or loans. The key is waiting upon God, waiting for God. And listen, I'm, this is my area. I'm very impatient. If you're at a red light and turns green, you get a horn. That's probably me. Wave to me backwards. Don't show me up. 
Is if you don't, if it's green, you don't go. You're going to get orange. I'm impatient. So that's when it comes to the microwave. Microwave time is very different from real time. But we got to wait on God. You must be willing to wait upon God to give direction as to how to obtain the item that's needed. Sometimes God wants us to wait patiently. And that's, wow. Patiently for things that are needed. Sometimes God wants to bless you. And he's got things work out in, in, in the life. And you go and do what you want to do. And you blow the whole thing. Imagine how many times we're going to go up to the judgment seat of Christ. Us born again Christians. And God said if you would have just waited. Look at what you could have had. You could have had curtain number three. But you chose, you know. Look at what you could have had. Had you only waited. But no, you went and did your own thing, and I couldn't bless that because that was not part of me. We talk about a Christian walk, walking with God, and that goes too with your pocketbook or your wallet. You've got to wait upon God. I'm preaching to myself. Okay? Proverbs 13, 11. Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished. Lottery tickets. Stealing. Improper, inhonest ways of making a living. But he that get, uh, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. Bible teaches you're to work. Now we're in America today that you know what? Americans that complain about their jobs, they complain about Monday, thank God it's Friday to get drunk and throw up on Sunday morning so you can't go to church and go start Monday back again, this wicked job I have, all that slave driver, blah, 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 blah. And God said, okay, fine. You don't enjoy the work, I'll get rid of the jobs and send it to over China where they will enjoy the work. Well, they'll enjoy my word and hug my word and kiss my word and listen to the preachers and listen to the people even though it's got to be underground. Don't you just love when I kick? Proverbs 14, 23 says, In all labor there is a profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth on only to punery. Profit. You know what a profit is in America today? Is how I can swindle you. How I can put something in your food that's not food. So God may provide the work for you to do, and the strength to do it, to make it possible for you to purchase what you need. He may give you the extra money, the extra hours. Now, is there anything wrong with getting a car every week? I mean, making payments every week? No, not if God's in it. Now, if you say, Lord, listen, I really need, my job is far away. And Lord, if, you know, if I talk to people at church or if, I, if I'm praying about it, this seems right now, this seems the only way. Is this your way? And God will answer the prayer, yes or no. All right, Lord, if I have to make payments every week, I got gasoline, I got this stuff, I got insurance. Lord, am I able, are you able, are you going to provide the need for this weekly bill that this car is going to cost? Or is there something else? And if God's in it, watch, okay, God, I truly believe that you're in this. And your boss comes up to you and says, listen, I'm going to give you a little more hours every week. Whoa, okay. That's exactly what I needed. Or, may the Lord come and say, somebody and say, listen, I've got a car for sale. Well, how much do you want for it? Well, I want X amount. Well, that's exactly how much I have to spend. Well, I'll sell it to you. And that's what happened to us. You never know what God, if you ask him. And don't think that's so foolish that God's going to put a brick wall and stop you from not doing what His will is because He will let you do what you want to do. 1 Timothy 5.8 But if any provide not for his home, own, and especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. And you say, well, I'm in America today. I'm out of work. I know 
we're losing the blessings from God in this country. And it's only going to get worse. And the government is only going to tie us even worse. Where during the Depression, you could sell apples or pencils in New York City. But under the law today, I mean, in order to sell apples or pencils, you got to get a, a documentation or a license to do it, which you can't even afford the license to keep yourself a survive and afloat. And First Timothy 5, I also must note, that's talking about widows. That's talking about women who are in your family who have no more support, have been cut because their husband has died. <clears throat> Christians ought to be ambitious and not lazy. We should never expect to just be handed. We should never expect things to be just handed to us. You can't sit there and expect God's going to throw blessings in your lap without you going to do something. Listen, I talked to a man one time. Oh, I want to get married. Are you going out looking for a wife? Well, no, I, God will bless me with one. What? How? You got to look. You got to seek. You got to knock. You got to ask. You got to make some mistakes. Imagine somebody who needs a car. And they don't go looking for a car. They expect, you know, they, they run downstairs in the garage, open up the door, oh, no car there yet, close the door. Before they go to bed, they run down the stairs, oh, no car yet. And they do that for 30 years. They say, Lord, where's the car? It's like in the parking lot, somewhere in the car lot, you idiot. Well, God should supply my all my needs and ain't in my driveway. God ain't going to hand it to you like that. God's going to put you in a situation to see, are you going to trust him or are you going to trust self? Ephesians 4.28 And what we're looking at here is labor, working. Let him that stole, steal no more. I used to preach this at the, at the prison. But rather, let him labor. Listen, you steal because you don't want to work. Working with his hands, the thing which is good, I watch this, that he may have to give to him that need it. All right, you, you've stolen things. You're a thief. You repent. You get yourself a job. You're paying your bills, and God says, with that money, help somebody else who needs. And get a re-blessing in return. But it's all about labor. You know what's happened to this country? A lot of people had a job. Now listen to me. They had a job. Husband had a job or even the wife had a job. They had a good income. They went and got a mortgage. They went and got a loan. And then boom, America, the economy fell. Next thing you know, they're out of work. Both of them. No money coming in. The house has been repossessed. The car has been towed away. And you got to question yourself. I mean, we really thought that was God. We really prayed about it. We, I mean, the house was perfect. Everything was perfect. And then how did this happen? Did God really say yes? Or are you in a valley? Or is it a government that does not want God no more? There are a lot of Christians out there who had an honest job. They worked hard. They did what they were supposed to. They rarely complain. Um, and because of the crisis that this country is, they lost their job and they have nothing today. We're becoming a third world nation as far as poverty and people dying in the streets. We got the greatest hospital care, but who can afford it? Second Thessalonians three, eleven and twelve. Second Thessalonians three, eleven and twelve. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now then that are such we command exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Now, there are some people, they don't have a job. They're busybodies. 
They're not going to the person's house and saying, listen, can I do something for you for my like, hey, did you hear about this person? Did you hear about that person? Blah 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 blah. That's why soap operas and talk shows are so popular. This is exactly what this verse is talking about. A bunch of people don't work during the day and listen to a talk show, a bunch of idiots who talk about nothing. I know that because I sat in Firestone listening to the stupid talk shows. Imagine a bunch of four or five women sitting down to see talking about junk and garbage where they should be home making their husbands dinner. Oh, that's right. They ain't got husbands. Should be home cleaning the house, doing laundry. No, they're sitting there talking about stupid garbage, junky things. That does not mean nothing. The Bible says, that uh, Matthew, that be advised, everything you say will be judged. Every word that man speaketh, both judgments. You're the work. Working keeps you out of trouble. It gives you a good alibi. There was a crime committed. Hey, how's that work? Well, let me go call your boss. Well, you get your word at work. Psalms 106, 13 through 15 says, They soon forget his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their souls. They didn't ask God. They lusted. And God gave them what they wanted, but still it didn't fill them up. Lusted. That's what want is. Need is, uh, you, you, it's mandatory. Want is lust. You know, baby, I want you. That's lust. When you really get that woman, say, honey, I need you. I'll be your, I'll be your man. I'll take care of you. I'll, you know, we work through things we'll, to the end. There's one thing worse than not getting what you want. And some of you are like, what? There is one thing worse than not getting what you want. And that is getting what you want. Well, yeah, yeah, right. When it's not really God's will to have it. Well, I wish you didn't say that. Or it's not yet God's timing. God has three answers to prayers. I'll give you an illustration. Number one is yes. Number two is no. Number three, not now. Okay. You've got a son. Four years old. He's got your razor in his hand. Daddy, I want to shave. Not now. No. Give me that razor. Okay. Your son is 14, 15 years old. It's time to shave if, if he needs a shave. Also with a little, with a girl, your daughter. When she wants to shave parts of her body that don't need to be shaved, you say not now. But when she looks like Matilda the Gorilla, now it's time to shave. Do it now. And God may say, no, but not now. You're not ready for that yet. You know, it takes time. To, you got to do things to make cake. You can't just open the cake box and take the, the stuff that's in the back and just swallow it. You got to do things to get the cake. Israel wanted something. And they wanted it right now. God has. Isn't that what the media is? Isn't that what the, the advertising? Now. Go for it. So they did not go to God and ask his counsel about it. Psalms 106, 13 through 15. They just started lusting for it. Coveting. Lusting and coveting are two same words. Thou shalt not covet. And wanting. Lusting, coveting, and wanting are all words that go together. 
You don't want in your house three children named lusting, coveting, and wanting. You don't want them. If you do, you avoid Toys R Us. You avoid the candy store. You avoid any place public where those three kids will be. You've seen lusting, coveting, and wanting in kids in Toys R Us. You've seen them in the, in the cake section of Walmart. You've seen them or heard them in the candy aisle. When Mama says no, you'll find out if that's lusting, coveting, or wanting. So God went ahead and allowed them to have it. Ooh, great God. But they were not happy. They had leanness in their soul. I want it, I want it, I want it. Oh, thank you, God. Oh. oh. You mean I got to pay for this, too? You mean I got to have this with it, too? Why is the tire flat? I got to buy another tire? Oh, this ain't that good. Wow. Many people have experienced that very thing in regard to vehicles. They drive into a car lot and drive out with a new car. That new car smell. That doesn't last. By the way, do you know by the Kelly Book Blue Book value that car depreciates as soon as you drive it off the lot? As soon as you start it and put it in drive, it's no longer a new car. It's old. It's used. Check the speedometer. How many miles is on that car before you start the key for the first time? This is not zero, zero, zero. I've never seen a car with zero, zero, zero. So you bought a used new car. The salesman was so helpful and made it so easy. They get their request, but later, in the leanness of soul, as they burden down and making payments for that new vehicle, oh boy, a new vehicle will break down like an old vehicle. Before you make that large purchase, P R A Y. That spells pray. It would be better to walk away from a store with nothing than to walk away from a store with the burden of large payments that you cannot really afford. It becomes quite embarrassing, too. If you will be willing to pray about your needs before rushing right out and buying something, then God can provide a way for you to earn the extra money that is needed. Or he may cause someone else to see that you have a need and move them to help you. The key is being waiting to wait. That word wait matches patience and I've already told you about me and patience I've given up. Psalms 27.14 says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. It's like verily, verily. It's like when God repeats something over and over. He puts in that verse, two weights. Get it? Two wait on the Lord. Matthew 6.33 God already knows what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't. You know, you may be a husband and a wife. Maybe you have a job and your wife is a homemaker. Okay. you got a good job. You go out, you buy that car or that house, whatever it is. And like the man over there in Luke, God says, Tonight thy soul be required. Now, you're saved. Not like that man in Luke. But the Lord, Lord knows that by morning, you're not going to live. You'll be with him in glory. Now, what do you just do if you didn't pray? You just put a big burden on your wife and your family. I don't care if that's the next day or five years of a 10-year loan. Or nine years of a 10-year loan. 
Matthew 6.33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, I can't say what God's going to do for you. God is limitless of what the things are possibilities. I can just think about 20 million things already. It's waiting on God. And even I have trouble on that. We all need prayer when it comes to patience. The last verse reminds us that God rewards a faithful life. God will meet the needs of the one who is saved and serving him faithfully. We must remember to put God first in our lives and in our finances. And we don't want God to touch that. That's that little area of God that, you know, well, I really would not have God be there. Because I want to get things that I want. I really don't care what God thinks. And that's the attitude when we don't wait. Proverbs 3, 9, and 10 We're going to get back into tithing. Proverbs 3, 9 to 10. Honor the Lord with thy substance. Now, substance is anything. Anything you got. New or used. You might have something in your house right now that would be better serve a Christian in your church who really needs it more than you do. You might have somebody over from church for dinner, the pastor, somebody. Will you just serve this, this, you know, this a quick meal kind of thing? Or would you serve the best meal you can you can afford without putting yourself in debt? With all thy substance and with the first fruits of all thy increase, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty. And thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Now, that verse really to bring up in the church age is really difficult. Because how many of you would raise your hand and say, Paul lived ungodly? Anybody out there? Would anybody care to say that Paul really, you know, he lived, a, he, he, he forsook God, he didn't wait patiently, and he just did what he wanted to do, and blah, blah, blah. How many of you out there would say that Paul, when it came to financial matters, was a waste, he was a sinner, and he would not have anything to do with this, with this meeting now? Okay, let me ask you a question. How many houses did Paul own? What year camel did he, did he buy and have? However you buy a camel. Did he have a two-hump camel? You know, with, with mud tracks, so the mud wouldn't come up to him. You, you, you think Paul honored the Lord with his substance? With all that he had? I know he did. But Paul lived a life in prison. Paul was stoned in one of the cities. Paul did not have a house. He probably did not have a camel. Of his, Jesus didn't even have a camel or an ass. Jesus slept outside in the mountains. He told one guy, he says, the foxes have holes, the birds have death, but the Son of Man does not have a place to lay his head. I'm throwing that because Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 is an Old Testament passage. You really can't apply that to a Christian because you may do right. And you may not have somewhere to put your head like Jesus and Paul. But if you do not tithe, that is give God 10% of your income, then you are robbing him and read Malachi 3, 8 through 10. If not, I'll read it for you. 
Will a man rob God? And there are people out there today in the church saying, well, this is Old Testament. This does not apply to the Christian. Listen, I'd rather give God 10%. I give more, by the way. I'm not going to tell you how much. I give my 10%. I give more. And I give the missionaries. And I give... Oh, that's all I'm going to say. I'm not under the fear of the law. But I'd rather give offering to God and a tithe and offering and think that God would do right by me for doing it. Than not do it at all and maybe face this verse and say, be standing before Jesus Christ and say, you robbed me. Well, this is Old Testament. Okay, I'd rather stand before Jesus Christ and say, you know what? You gave what I gave to you. You gave it back. I honored you with that. You weren't under you weren't under the ten percent tithing. You know the church was away from that, but you know what? You still gave. You gave out of faith. You did a lot better than somebody who didn't give and rather came up with excuses on why not to give than to give. I would not want to be standing before God and having to call me a liar. Okay. Or call me a thief, okay? Yet have you robbed me, it says. But ye say, where have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Let's talk about Israel. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. That ye may be meat, that it may be meat in my house for the priests. And the offerings. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven, how often did Paul eat? He ate often. Did Paul have clothes? Yes, he had clothes. Was he allowed to have his friends come and visit him? Yes, he was allowed to have friends come and visit him. Was Paul given paper and pencil to write with? Yes, he was given paper and pencil to write with. Paul was even asked, I think it was Timothy, bring my parchments, bring, my, you know, my clothes. Paul wasn't stark naked and his man dying a destitute. He gave to the Lord and the Lord gave back. But today in America, we know we got to have wheels. We got to have a house. We got to have this. We got to have Mickey D's. We got to have all the great things. We won't be content with air, water, and whatever food God gives us, bread. You know, if, it was, if Jesus came on the coast of America to feed the 5,000 with bread and fish, we only complained because we didn't get a Whopper with it. We didn't get the supersize. Lord, you didn't bring me a Coca-Cola. I don't want fish. I don't want bread. I want a pizza. You ever think about that? At the feeding the 5,000, 4,000, you ever imagine somebody sitting there like, Fish and bread. That's all he got. I want a sandwich. Well, you get what the Lord gives you. You don't eat at all. Are you having financial troubles? Have you been robbing God? Now, I know that if you don't tithe, I've known people, I know personally, God will get your offering in tithes. Medical bills, problems. He will get your tithes. He's your father. He's bound to correct you when you do wrong. There is no way for you to live a prosperous life if you are robbing God. You can't be stingy. You're like Ebenezer Scrooge. All he took was took, 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 took. He never gave. Then he met the three spirits. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I know they have some kind of past, present, future. That, that's the world's version. You probably don't know what Ebenezer means and know that's in the Bible, do you? Is there no way for a Christian to remove himself from the curse? Yes. Bring ye the, uh, bring ye the tithes into the storehouse. And the Lord will pour out blessings. Now that blessings may not be the blessings you want. 
you may not get a steak dinner every night. Personally, I don't like steak. You may have to have beanies and weenies. It may be a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Listen, a peanut butter and jelly, maybe just a peanut butter sandwich at the table with a glass of water and Jesus Christ sitting with you is a lot better than filling it on and, and uh, seafood galore and having nobody sit with you. You can go without you can go from being cursed financially to being blessed financially, and that's not gonna be overnight. Don't think I give God a ten dollars and God's gonna give me ten thousand dollars. Hallelujah. That's a lie from hell. From a preacher that is of hell, of Satan, second Corinthians eleven. Listen, Howard Hughes. Had all the riches, but he died a shriveled up man. A little woman from Kentucky up in the hills of Tennessee who knows the Lord and loves the Lord has nothing, has died with great smile on her face with the Lord Jesus Christ beating her at her death has more of a testimony than a richer man who dies and goes to hell. Read Luke 16. Psalms 37 25. I have been young and now I am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Now that's another verse I don't really like. Righteous are never forsaken. But there have been stories where Moderators for Jesus Christ and their family had to beg, had to steal. What are you going to do? You say, well, the Bible, no, that Psalms is Old Testament again. That's a danger. When you go run into the Old Testament for a church age doctrine. The Bible does not forbid taking out a loan. Get that. But as we will shall see, the Bible commands people to loan money to poor to meet their needs. But there are restrictions applied. If you do find yourself in a position to take out a loan after much prayer, consider the following carefully. If you get a loan to buy a house, the bank or realtor will show you the principal amount of your loan. And the amount of the interest that you will pay if you do not pay the loan off early. The principal is the amount that you actually borrow. It is not uncommon to end up paying three times the original amount financed for your house. By the time a 30-year loan is paid off, you buy something for $10,000, whatever it is. When you get done, you may pay $30,000, $20,000 just in interest alone. you got to ask your que yourself a question. Is that interest worth it? Maybe with that loan, if I'm, I'm, if I'm supposed to pay $150 a month, can I pay maybe $200 a month and try to pay it off early? And be careful. Because there's some loans out there, if you pay off early, they will find and they will subtract. They will they'll put a charge on you, I'm trying to say. They will charge you for early payoff. Watch out for that one. Make sure you ask the question, if I get this loan and I pay it off early, will there be any penalties? That's the word I was looking for. Penalties for paying a loan off early. And there is warning, warning sign. Paying interest literally cripples a young couple, and may and many will do well to recover by time that they retire. Make sure that you buy things that are your needs and not just what you want. Now, part B. Go over this real quick. Be careful when giving loans. We talked about getting loans, now giving someone a loan. Someone's come up to you, a church member, and said, Brother, 
I need some money. The bank won't get it, or I won't be able to pay the bank, whatever. Psalms 112. You got to read these verses of Psalms 112, verse 4. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. Psalms 112, verse 5. A good man shows favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Discretion. Verse 9. He has dispersed. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endureth forever. His horn shall be exalted with honor. This chapter clearly shows that God that blesses and grants rich grants riches to people. Now look at the words here in verse 4, compassion. Somebody may really need the money. Verse 5 says, lend it. You may have to lend money out. Verse 5 also says discretion. You just don't hand out the money to every Tom, Dick, and Harry. Or shall I sound every Saint Tom, every Saint Dick, and every Saint Harry. Verse 9, give it to the poor. Now Deuteronomy 18, 18. <clears throat> but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. For it is he that giveth, the, giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant with he, with he swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. The Lord blesses financially. It's the Lord that gives you the money. Not your employer. It's the Lord. Remember we read last week where the promotion comes from the Lord? Well, the money comes from the Lord. And he may give you a certain amount of money that you may have to help someone else. You may give, free will give money to somebody to help them. You may give it to as a loan. 1 Timothy chapter 6 is a great chapter about money and riches. Verses 17 and 18. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. Who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Now this is the New Testament. This is under the church. God gives a man riches. That they do good. That they be rich in good works. Ready to distribute. Willing to communicate. Listen. If you're a born again Christian like J.C. Penny. You own a store. And you give your people off Sundays off. Chick-fil-A gives the Sundays off to their to their employees because they want to serve God. You've got money. Listen, you could be a, a, a Christian and have a million dollars. You're not a sinner. What do you do with a million dollars? Do you help your church? Do you support missions? Do you help people in your church that need it and can't do it? When God blesses us, He expects us to help others in need. But remember, he says, lend with discretion. I'm going to get into the little thing here before we get into this. When somebody comes up to me on the street and needs money, I never give them money. Never. I will take them. If they want food or anything like that, I will tell them. I will take them into a place. I will buy them a meal, what they want, and a soft drink. I've had only two people ever take me on that offer. Only two people. One I took the guy into Burger King, and another one I took into a like a Seven Eleven place. Everybody else, well, well, no, oh, no, yeah, yeah, well, well, you want cigarettes or booze? And I'm not paying for that. That's discretion. Don't hand out your money free will. Blah 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 blah. You'll be accountable. Discretion means ability to make responsible decisions. Individual choice of judgment or judgment. Power of free decision or latitude of choice 
with certain legal bounds. And that's the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. It's a person's own choice whether to offer a loan to someone. If a person has a need, not a want. I want cigarettes. No. You need food or water. You don't need cigarettes or booze. But has proven himself to be untrustworthy and or lazy. Then that person will probably not be granted a loan. Listen, don't give money and say it's a loan to somebody who's not working. Or trying to make an effort to work. And we're just running out of quick time here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop this real quick and we're going to do a part two or part three. So let me stop this.